It's a great pleasure for me today on behalf of the uh, Applied Sociology thematic group of TASA to welcome Dr. San Perosi, uh, who will be speaking to us on parental alienation and particularly how he uses um, principles and ideas from sociology as part of the work that he does with families. Um, he's a clinical sociologist and counsellor. He's doing research in this area as well as being a practitioner. And um, I'm really excited to be able to introduce him to you today because we had a fantastic conversation last year at the TASA conference, and this is an extension of that. Uh, I'd like to also acknowledge that um, we are all today joining from different parts of the um, of Australia, so on different on lands of different Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations. Um, I myself am on Wallamudical and sometimes uh, Gadigal land in the Aurora Nation, and um, I acknowledge that the land that I'm on was never ceded, and um, that I yeah I acknowledge that the role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders past and present have in helping to mend um, the conflicts that we have and to build a stronger nation together. Uh, so Stan, if you would like to start your presentation, that would be great. Well, thank you, Catherine, and welcome everyone. And also welcome to those people. Hopefully we'll see the recording. So I'll make a start. And Sorry, Stan, can I just, oh yeah, you've got it. There we are. Sorry about yeah. that. Go for it. Yeah, my apologies. The screen sharing at mine is a bit clumsy. Um, operator error, sorry. So, um, look, thank you very much. Uh, what I'll be talking about today is a particular presentation, an issue affecting families, parents and children that's traditionally been dominated by psychologists and lawyers, particularly in family law. And what I'm pitching today is an application of sociological theories and principles and approaches to lift this presentation out of the mire of psychology and law and make it a, an issue of social concern and public health policy. It is actually a form of family violence, a particularly egregious form of coercive control where the children are actually weaponized against the parent. So, I call it a cancel culture no one is talking about. Another word for it is identicide. That is the, the destruction, the annihilation, the cancelling, the valuing of parental identity that a child does against a parent disproportionate to their historical relationship with them. And the term, am I still a parent? That's the impact it has on targeted parents because they come to question you know whether they're socially recognized whether they have a social identity as a parent anyway uh just a quick talk about me uh historically i'm a, a counselor and psychotherapist or i was until i became a sociologist some might say when i saw the light there you go i actually apply the results of my research in, so in the sociology of parental alienation into the sphere of working with parents who've lost contact with their children as a result of this presentation, and also in family law where I, I give evidence in the family court, and I run court order remediations for alienated parent-child relationships. Before I get going uh, proper, I just want to say that in my experience over the years of working in this area and talking about it, I have noted how it affects people, often in very surprising ways. It's a controversial subject. It's highly contested. I don't expect listeners to agree necessarily what I'm saying. What I'm inviting is the discussion. So I'll talk for about half an hour, and then I would like to have a discussion about it. The other aspect where it may, may affect people is often people uh, don't necessarily recognise something that's happened in their own family until they see it and hear it defined. And it can come as a bit of a shock. So I don't mean to hurt anyone or wound anyone, but I'm aware that some of you may have reactions to what I'm talking about. So please take care of yourself. Okay, so let's move on. 
So let's look at the context. We're talking about alienated children. And, and the, the idea of alienation is that children develop a resistance to a parent or refuse to have a relationship with them. As I said before, that's, it has no connection or is disproportionate to their historic relationship. And it's as stark as a child having a loving relationship with a parent and then claiming that photographs of them and their parent together have been doctored in some way. Or they refer to their parent that they previously loved by their first name. Both of those ex brief examples signal some kind of assault on the identity of the parent. It is recognised as a form of child psychological abuse, family violence. The effect on children is quite profound in terms of their mental and social health, and I'll talk a bit more about that later, but it goes without saying that if there's if they're psychological abuse, there's harm that comes with it. Targeted parents, the parents who are who have had their relationship with their children ruptured, they also suffer, and the research that I've done shows that they're stigmatised in some way. A very negative identity is collapsed upon them that they can't actually fight against. And so they're marginalised within their own family and often outside of that in society. For example, how does a mother or father talk to their peer groups about the fact that their children don't want to spend time with them and refuse to have anything to do with them? And that's particularly difficult for mothers because the social overlay for mothers, for my research, is that to be a good mother, to be a good woman, you have to have a relationship with your children. As I said before, this whole field has been dominated by uh, clinical and, and legal narratives. Historically, parental alienation was formulated initially, originally as parental alienation syndrome in the 1980s. It was premature. There wasn't a lot of good evidence to support a disease classification for parental alienation. And I, when I talk about it, I also draw attention to the fact there's no such thing as family violence syndrome, yet family violence is recognised as a major social problem. The other angle is what is the nature of the family that's under assault here from alienation? And the bottom line is that we, we have a very different family in the second decade of the 21st century than the family we started out with, say, in the 1980s when this was first, first formulated. So basically families are a collection of at-will relationships organised around a family discourse and connected via family narratives. They transcend time and place. Families now have multiple physical households, but may be one family. There's been profound changes in society and the nature of work since the 1980s that have solidified that. So one of the things that the research, the sociological research demonstrates is that the process of alienation is a discourse. It's what I call the alienation discourse. It's a discourse of identicide, of cancelling a parent's identity. So children who have previously loved the parent will call their parent, target the parent by their first name, or they may even refuse to name them at all as a parent, and, and it's an it, or a they, or a them. And as one parent said, their experience of that is they're rubbing you out as they move closer to the centre. He can, he can feel his, his identity being rubbed out. Part of the discursive process is the idea of communicated action. And that is that narratives communicate behaviours. So behaviours are not only physical things that we do, but also what we say and how we say it. So a child might say things like, you stole my favourite toy, I never want to see you again. Or they may, may call their mum or dad, or they might call their mum a bitch. They might call their dad a bastard. And these are behaviours that are unprecedented in their, in their uh, history with that parent. So, you know, these are examples of behaviours that are communicated in words. It's about language. Another aspect of the discursive process is what we call power relations. Power communicated through narratives. 
the concept of perspecticide is well known in family violence circles as the dominant reality imposed upon a target a target partner or a targeted parent. A related concept is gaslighting. You know, you say the sky is blue, I say the sky is grey, and what would you know about it anyway? And so using demeaning practices and dominating words and narratives, someone's idea, reality is imposed on the other. And then children accept a parent's perspective, a, a parent's reality, because that's the price they have to pay to have a relationship with that parent. So what then happens is that the combination of the cancelling of the parent's identity, usually by stigmatisation, communicating exclusionary narratives, communicating dominating power about realities, makes the family oppressive. It, it, it is the alienation discourse in practice that works on the basis of you can be part of this family as long as you exclude the parent I tell you to. So let's put it into a bit of contrast here. There's two different narratives here representing two different discourses. One is what might seem like a normal inclusive set of family relationships, what I call a discourse of inclusion. Most parents and families would be familiar with that one. You know, the ideal world in a separated divorced family is that you know, each parent celebrates their child's relationship with the other parent as much as their own. That's the ideal. The other one demonstrates the alienation discourse. So if you look carefully at that narrative there, are you sure you want to go? What's the message that's conveyed to the child about that other parent? I just want you to be safe. What is their favoured parent signalling to that child about their relationship with the other parent? I'll miss you terribly. I don't know what I'll do with myself. Who's that about? What is the obligation implicitly placed upon the child? This is why where discourse analysis comes into working out what's happening in family relationships. So one of the things about the magnitude of the problem, and I'll, I'll put US statistics there as well to give us sort of a comparison. In some respects, these are frightening statistics because they're sitting there unrecognised. The Australian Bureau of Statistics has come up with some statistics from their research that uh, goes back to 2016, and it's a surprising proportion of both men and women who report that their ex-partner lying to their children with the intent of turning them against them. Now, that's actually an alienating behaviour. That's actually quite a confronting a problem to have, especially when the child discovers the lie later on in life. The, the US estimate of 0.5% of children, it's the best that can be estimated, like all estimates, it has its problems and how it's formulated. I'm happy to discuss that towards the end. But this is to give you a sense of what we're dealing with in terms of size. So for alienated children, we call this a, an adverse childhood experience, an ACE. And alienation is no different to any other experience such as child abuse. So the whole raft of very familiar adverse outcomes that uh, comes to children. Uh, I don't typically deal with adult alienated children, but my colleagues on my team do, and the outcomes are pretty stark. So, you know, they suffer quite disproportionately, and the remediation for that is elusive. Not many practitioners know what to do. For targeted parents, the parents who have lost or had their relationship with their children ruptured, I'll just draw on a couple of points there. This came out of my research. It was mixed methods research. So I ran a series of semi-structured interviews around a, an alienation inventory 
and also uh, ran a validated alienation inventory and a stigma consciousness inventory as well. So it was qualitative and quantitative. So the themes that came out for parents, I'll draw on this one, uh, cash for kids. This is something that happens in family law where a deal is done where one parent will increase or allow a child to spend time with the other parent in exchange for some kind of material consideration, you, cash, property, whatever. Those deals usually fall through when there's alienation. Cover story. Many targeted parents don't know what to say in public or to their peers about the fact their children are not seeing them and refuse to have anything to do with them. So they make up a story. I still have as a client a, a mum, and her alienation story is probably 25 years old now. Her adult children are in their mid to late 30s. Her cover story in her place of work is that she's a victim of family violence and she had to escape a violent situation and had to leave her kids behind. That's her story. Because that's more readily understood. So there's just a couple of themes that can't come out that are really quite significant. The significance of the cover story is that when we pick up the cover story, we know we have a high, high degree of certainty that that parent has had an alienation experience. So as I said, um, the other part of the research was quantitative. And I ran a, a social alienation measure and a stigma consciousness measure. And there was a high, high association between feelings of normless, or anomie, normlessness. Those of you who know your social alienation will know what I'm talking about. Normlessness and isolation associated with, with consciousness of being stigmatized as an alienated parent. That gives us a means to a question or to investigate narratively and through discourse presentations that are claimed to be alienation. The I mentioned somewhere deep deviancy, the ends justify the means. So what we observe with alienating parents, the favoured parents, is they will do whatever it takes to eliminate the other parent. They don't have a moral compass. In fact, it's quite amoral. And they often get advantages through our social and legal systems by actually legal and administrative abuse because they have no moral boundaries about what they do. So let's talk about what makes it a sociological issue and on what basis would we, would we be interested in its application? So what's the nature of reality and knowledge that we're dealing with here? And really it's the idea that there's a discourse external to the observer. They're unaware of it, but it structures reality. It structures how they know things. And so structuration is this idea that discourse can have structure-like properties and can appear to be solid. So the social nature of parental alienation we've talked about before that's been dominated by clinical medicalized language and discourse, legal narratives. When we apply a sociological imagination to it, we then pull up personal, cultural and structural aspects that are not necessarily available to those dominant discourses. So in the personal, we talk about how it affects a parent and a child. In the cultural, we talk about what happens at the micro level, meso level in the family, how the culture of the family changes and it becomes normalized to, to stigmatize a parent. And at a structural level, we look at how structures like our social institutions and family law structurally support alienation. In fact, in the words of one family law judge, we're validating bad behavior in the best interests of the child. I'll leave you to deal with the inherent contradictions on that one. So how do we respond? Well, we look at uh, de-alienation as a practice, as a structural response, as an anti-oppression response. And we look at the discourses that occur structurally 
in areas like well, my work is in family law. And so the discourses in family law shape how people present their cases and they can exclude the possibility of alienation as a form of child abuse. What's the problem? Silencing of targeted parents who are in fact the most reliable witnesses to what's happening. Their narratives, their witnessing is the evidence socially and legally. And of course, children are being coerced into narratives that make them think they thought of it when in fact it was imposed by another parent. Just as here's a quick example of a job for sociology, the policy and politics. Now, some of you may disagree with what I've said there, and that's fine. I put in submissions to the Australian Law Reform Commission on the amendments of the Family Law Act, and also to the UN on their call for input on custody cases and violence against women and children. In both cases, the way the responses were invited in my view, suffered from very strong confirmation bias. The outcomes were ideologically predetermined. And so it's a great example of how there isn't any real discussion about alienation as a form of family violence. It's actually viewed ideologically, for example, as a form of violence men use against women to get their children and to defeat claims of family violence and child sexual abuse. It's not as black and white as that. So what? Well, as I said, much of my work uh, is with targeted parents, roughly 50% uh, fathers, 50% women, uh, all sorts of family configurations, sexual orientations, and increasingly gender identities. So what I do is I work with a parent who's lost contact with their children through alienation, Often the situation is so severe, it has to go through the family court. They have to get a reversal of care and responsibility for that child on the basis that they will continue to be abused by the other parent and the other parent doesn't have the capacity to change. So that means we have to run a, a special workshop, an experiential educational workshop that addresses the sociological impacts on children, how they view reality, how they form views under adult influence. And there is a legal precedent there, Milton and Milton, that we set up in 2020 with our, one of our first cases to go through the family court. The concept of therapeutic jurisprudence is really important. It's what I call the iron fist in the velvet glove. We are the velvet glove. The law is the iron fist. And so, because some parents won't change unless there is some kind of legal imperative and incentive to change. So where do we go from here? I think there's a lot of opportunities for applying sociology to this field. There needs to be a new narrative at the social level about what alienation means at society level, at structural level, at every level. Because the bottom line is parental alienation is just the demon spawn of social alienation. And I would, I would propose that we're living in a very alienated, alienating society right now. And it's no surprise that alienation permeates every level of how we live and how we work and how we relate. So lots of possibilities there for us to be involved. And I really think the principal one is around the alienation as a social strategy, is how to get this across at every level in society, in, in the law, in community practice, in schools, as a public health issue, and to deal with it the same as family violence, public health, social policy, health policy. So I've done that fairly quickly, folks. I'm gonna unshare my screen, and I'm happy to have questions, have discussions, Thanks for bearing with me. Thanks very much, Sam. I'm just going to stop recording and then ask if people have questions or comments.
But thank you, first of all, for presenting today. It's a fascinating topic. Thank you.